عرفت الهوى مد عرفت الهوى عرفت الهوى مد عرفت الهوى وأغلق قلبي على العلا وأغلق قلبي على Alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful to Allah that I, I come today. Uh, I am made to stand here by my daughter. She made me promise. She came all the way to ask that question, am I on the right path? So she made me promise to stand here to ask a question for her, but I have three points. But first, her birthday is coming up on the 16th of May. And she said that if I stand here to ask this question, it will be a birthday present for her. <laughs> And she said, uh, I mean, she's a very good daughter, she loves the Quran, but when she goes to school or when she goes to gatherings, she becomes confused because when she talks a lot about Islam, she will be branded as maybe an extremist. And when she goes the other side, it's like, you know, you're too modern, too Western. So maybe she wants to find an answer, the equilibrium, the balance that you mentioned in a very simplistic language that people who are non-academics might understand. Now, my second point is this. Uh, I understand the, the question by the student um, as part of the academic team. I also face a lot of questions and worry because when Malaysia uh, went through the strategic plan to transform the higher education, I'm very deeply worried because everything is called world class and global, global education that I question uh, one of the objectives uh, with global and world class education comes universal values and I question that and until today I did not get the answers what they mean by universal values perhaps today I will be enlightened a little bit more about universal values in Islam and non-Islam now the last point is this now, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought one of the, um, about Kiyama, one of the signs of the Kiyama, that the light will shine from the West, and we see that happening, and I'm really uh, very happy to see a lot of the Sheikh and Bustas coming from the West with solid understanding and the philosophy and the, you, know, you, you reach out to many of us we are having a vacuum here, inshallah. Uh, we have a lot of ustas too, but sometimes it's the modern world, the world with a lot of information through IT, you need something more. You cannot just preach without full knowledge and understanding of the universal world. Now that leads me to the last point. Now you have a lot of um, people who convert from other religions to Islam and it's so refreshing but on the other hand people like me who was born in Islam born with the religion I want to relate to you an experience I was in an American field service exchange student and at the age of 18 I was going to the, the church my American parents would bring me to the Sunday church every Sunday and what struck me was the love, the kindness that they showed me. And, uh, you know, I even memorized the American anthem, which I want to relate back to the first speaker, the first shape, the pursuit of happiness. Now, that, the understanding that I had from the American anthem, the pursuit of happiness, was different then, it's different now. But now it's like the pursuit of happiness is more on consumerism, more on aping the West. So while we have this, this uh, the wave of uh, Westerners converting to Islam, please, I beg you, all my brothers, there is a real issue now that the Muslims are converting to Christianity. Thank you. Bismillah. 
First of all, sorry for making you stand for so long. It's bad adept to make you uh, stand for so long. Um, I want to just preface um, just some brief comments before we turn it over to the two other speakers. Um, the Quranic perspective is one uh, that all of humanity is in need of each other. That we made you tribes and peoples so in order that you may get to know one another. In other words, is that, that if we look at philosophically speaking, some people say that, okay, the reality is that human beings are always in conflict, so doggy dog, survival of the fittest, you have to deal with the reality, real politic. But the Quranic perspective is that the wisdom in creation is that there's takamun, is that we make each other whole. And so in reality, that we're in need of each other. But the Muslim civilization, although it, it spread to China fairly soon after the prophetic period, we took paper from the, the Chinese civilization, that we took the many principles of medicine from the Greek and the Indian civilization, and, and, and on and on and on. So the reality of the affair is from the Quranic perspective that we're all in need of one another. I will say though, even though what you just mentioned, uh, I really believe that when I say my people, I mean that speaking solely in the context of the United States, I really believe they're in more need of what you all have here than the other way around. I really believe that. They're more in need of what you all have here than the other way around, even though that the general principle is that we're all in need of each other. And um, I could qualify that statement if you want. Um, the first question about the question on behalf of your daughter, um, the first thing that I will say is, is that one, that she realizes it's possible. What she's seeking is possible. That you can make the synthesis. The most amazing thing about a human being is that we have a spirit and a physical body, which are opposites. And Allah has made us human. In other words, that it is possible to both be that modern, depending upon how you define the word modern, and traditional at the same time. Right? I'm an American Muslim. I'm from the United States of America. Born, raised, heartland, Kansas City, Kansas. Right? That I'm as American as you can get, but I'm also Muslim. And that to me I have I'm not caught up. Right? I know what it means to be an American. I'm not trying to not be American. I can't be anything other than American. But I'm Muslim. And I think that that, that the the way because you asked about how to do it, is where you, when you start to taste of the reality of faith, and that your iman is it gets beyond merely that something you talk about where you experience it, you taste it. There's a sweetness to it that you can't speak of identity without the spiritual dimension. Right? This is the core. This is the essence of identity. Is the spiritual dimension. And once that, because that your relationship with God, Allah, that it's with your heart and your spirit. Your spirit is how you love Allah. Your heart is how you know Allah. And that when Iman seeps and is absorbed to the depths of your heart, is that then all of those outward things is that they become easy. And yes, it requires a little bit of knowledge of law so you can know what to do and what not to do so you stay within the limits and so forth. But primarily that when you experience experiential belief, uh, then that, that's the way to, to achieve what she is looking for. Um, the topic of universal values, I don't think we have a time to talk about that in detail here. Um, there's a very interesting lecture, if you want to listen online, by Dr. Sherman Jackson, which I think is of great benefit. And essentially, what he tries to do in this lecture is he takes uh, the, the idea of the, the, the UN's Declaration of Human Rights, and he speaks about it from an Islamic perspective and how we would categorize these same virtues and values and so forth and what would be a potential some perspective on it. And it's again definitely going to be nuanced. Is that there's many things that are, there's overlap we would accept fully, other things we wouldn't necessarily agree with. And some things we would agree with, but we would put them in a hierarchy. So there's a lot of nuance when it comes to that. We don't have time to really talk about the details of universal values and so forth. I mean, that's, it's, it's way too detailed of, of, a, of a discussion. Um, the, the last part about pursuit of happiness and consumerism, I don't know if I fully understand the question that's in there, but I, I will just say about that, that this is to me what led me, one of the main reasons that led me to become Muslim. Because that I realized there was a void in the modern world. The modern world is a civilization that provides great services, applied technology, 
that it's given us a comfort level that we can be in your very humid climate and not be profusely sweating and, uh, and while we're indoors and modern engineering allows us to experience with microphones and so forth and me travel 20 hours in a plane to even be here before you. Whereas before, if I had to take a boat, it would have been a lot longer. Um, so there's no doubt that there's benefits of modern applied technology, but I think that one of the voids of the modern world, and this to me is the greatest thing that Islam could offer to the modern world, is that, that it offers a, a true real solution to that void, to that vacuum, to the decentered, that nomadic modern person, that it allows him or her to be able to be centered, to be able to have a that faith that doesn't require you to that not take into consideration many of these trends and currents in the modern world, but to embrace them and to understand them and to take them on, and that you might that uh, that uh, suffer from some aspects of that, but at the same time that there's a possibility for you still though to that achieve that your Adamic human potential, and so to me that that. That, that void that is felt, that once you open up your heart to the meanings of the remembrance of Allah, that you have a whole different perspective on consumerism. That a consumer, you'll never, ever, ever be happy. This is the whole thing. This is the nature of the son of Adam. That if he wants that something, that he always wants something else. Then he wants something else. Then he or she wants something else. And it never ends. Is it that the word that was mentioned by Imam Afro's Tama, if you look in the Arabic language, there's a ta, meme, and an ayn. All three are hollow letters, and the person of greed is hollow. That you you'll never fulfill those insatiable desires because the desires desires are not they're they're precisely that insatiable. You're not able to fulfill them. What you're fulfilled by is by putting food for your soul, and that food of your soul comes from sacred knowledge. It comes from the remembrance of God and worship and things of this nature. And uh, this there's no pursuit of happiness without that understanding. Doesn't mean that we don't live in the world. We live in the world and can enjoy the world. But that true happiness comes from, from that. Any questions? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in so that uh, Sheikh Bil Karim can uh, correct me for anything that I would say wrongly. Uh, firstly, um, in, in relation to identity, uh, firstly, I think for Muslims, we, we, we would do a great service to uh, our children and certainly to each other if we help our, ourselves to understand to not allow others to define your identity. This is a very important aspect for us to actually recognize this. For teenagers, for example, brand or peer pressure, etc. All of these things are part and parcel of that, that issue of identity. Uh, also, I want to sort of have a brief uh, English grammatical lesson. That, that if you look at this aspect of, say, for example, if I was to say, I am an Australian Muslim, or am I a Muslim Australian? If we can simply return to grammar, we will understand it very easily and potentially save ourselves 50% of the identity crisis, in, which is in grammar. And that is this. Let's look at this. If I say this is, this is a good phone because it's from Apple, um, uh, the good describes the phone. So when I say I'm an Australian Muslim, yeah, as, as opposed to iPhone good, exactly, that's right, yes, yes, the adjective describes the noun. So if I'm saying I'm an Australian Muslim, or for you as Malaysian Muslim, and I'll talk from the Australian perspective briefly, that when I speak about the Australian Muslim, my Muslimness will be defined through the experience of being in Australia. I'll give you a very simple example, and I'll talk about architecture. My architectural response to building a mosque in Australia will be very different to Africa, for example. That's the Australianness that allows me to be able to do what I do with the Hassan within the, within the milieu of Australia as a Muslim. But if I say Muslim Australian, then there are, there's a, there are values that I hold that are important within Islam that might not necessarily be uh, the same for others uh, as well in that regard. So a simple ad ad adjective understanding there allows us to understand how that they are not in fact mutually exclusive per se. Uh, uh, and secondly, the question of universal values. It is definitely a very complicated uh, uh, discussion that makes to happen. If I can make a few quick points. One of our problems is that we are Islamizing everything. So this kind of an Islamic mathematics or Islamic education, etc. There are relevances to that. But when we speak of this idea of, you know, what are Islamic values, a very simple way to understand that is that 
anything that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then this is something which is a value that we uphold and we could say that this is in fact a universal value. The problem today is that in fact, if I can again use Australia as an example, Australia actually created what they call 12 core values. But those values are actually universal, they're not Australian. So for example, integrity, honesty, fairness, these are not Australian values. And this is, a, this is a problem where we are Australianizing, if I could say, certain values. We are also doing this idea, uh, we are also falling for this idea by simply throwing words and Islamizing them in a kind of a separation from the universality of humanity and their fitrah, their acceptance in that regard. Helpful Fulul is a classic example of the Prophet's time in accepting something that actually comes from the, 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 the innate nature of good. And I think uh, that has to be taken into account uh, that we don't fall for this idea that somehow certain things are not applicable to others. So people who might not come from a particular faith, they also have these values. Right? They also have these values and we, we, we must always remember of this equality of respect in, the, in that regard and having sincere concern because we are not we are not Bani Islam as a tribe of Islam that somehow we are exclusive to these values. The last point uh, in, in relation to uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, you know, conversion to, to, to Christianity as well as uh, in a pursuit for happiness and I think that has been mentioned uh, much in that regard. All I can say there is that if we return to the question number one, which is about identity, I think that's the key problem for those people who might be leaving Islam uh, in this regard. Uh, and this is not to say anything about any other religion. Uh, I, uh, I have come to a firm conclusion through a uh, rational as well as an experiential proof that Islam is in fact true. So th this aspect for me is something which is uh, 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 it's not based on some fa uh, some blind uh, following of the forefathers. Actually, has come to a consciousness that in fact this is true. So I think we need to get our children, our youth, our peers, and ourselves with each other to have that experience of the truth of this Islam that we are not only experiencing through an assertion of Islam. So, for example, if I could bring about a uh, implied controversial topic, and in other words, converting or, or suggesting or asserting that Sharia equals hudud punishment. Now, no wonder we have a climate of people going, whoa, you know, we don't want Sharia. Uh, because it, it, Sharia is not just hudud punishment. The fact that you are making mujahada patiently to listen to my ramble, you're already practicing Sharia. Sabr is part of Sharia. You know, so, you know, uh, 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 that obviously is kind of an extreme kind of a, uh, uh, example, but without, without a doubt true. We have to be careful that we actually have a true understanding and experience of this religion because that, full, that forms our identity. If the best way to make sure nobody else defines your identity or that you can come into an identity crisis like the ISIS crisis is that you have to judge yourself measure yourself, is this prophetic or not? Can I see these characteristics? Can I see these virtues? Can I see these assertions in the man who exemplified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's message? If I can find them there, and that was his holistic, true, overall experience as, as, a, as a person who, who gave us this example, then this is something which was virtuous. This is a don't let others define this for you. If we can identify ourselves uh, uh, in our following and our imitation of the Prophet Sallallahu you've got the identity. You've got the identity. Okay, uh, we can go to a few more questions because of the time. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. The point that I'm a map was ended on was the point that we were making today. Uh, there's no universal values except um, those values are the one who has sin as a mercy to the universe. Um, and he said, and this is from his uh, from his Khasais, and it's in Sahih Hadith, Mu'ithu Nasi Kafa. I was sent to humanity in its entirety. He's the only one that could say that of the messengers. He said all of the other messengers didn't have that. Like, you know, 
Sheikh Yahya and I, we made a contract with Allah like about 20 years ago. We said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, when you say that, what I just said is an assumption for you. That universal values are the values of Muhammad. Anyone who's in doubt of that, you got to review your shahada. Yeah, honestly speaking, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. Imam al Ghazali said, everyone needs to repent. Kuffar, uh, those who are outside of Islam, like I won't attribute this to Shaykh Yahya, like I used to be, they repent by coming to Islam. Muslims who don't understand the realities of Islam repent by uh, learning the reality of Islam. These are assumptions that we have to have. Um, and then for your daughter, uh, you know, Bada al Islam al Gharibat wa yasa'u sayyaudu gharibat kama bada fatuba al ghuraba. You know, Islam began as something strange and it will return to being strange as it began. So blessed uh, are the strangers, the Prophet. Tuba is a tree in Jannah. Uh, its trunk is in the Prophet's home uh, and it has a branch in every uh, of the homes of all of the believers. You know, it's lonely out here. It's lonely at the end of time. Uh, you know, dream big with Allah. This is my advice to your uh, daughter. Dream big with Allah and uh, connect to Shiyukh and they will fulfill beyond your wildest dreams. Uh, we had a sheikh once that said, everybody, make uh, your biggest intention. So we went to him afterwards and said, you know, I can't make a very big intention. You, uh, I'll serve you and you make an intention on our behalf. Okay. Um, and we traveled the whole globe with this person after that survey. Alhamdulillah. Make dream, and as Sheikh Yahya said, it's for real. It's really there. Anybody who says it's not, they don't know what they're talking about. It will be there as long as the Quran is with us. Um, it will be there, just keep looking. Um, and then lastly, something practical. Uh, send a lot of salawat on Prophet Muhammad says so. Send a lot of salawat on Prophet Muhammad. Uh, your um, sadness, your sorrow will be alleviated and your sins will be forgiven. He said that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You'll be with Allah and you'll be mentioned with Allah uh, and His Messenger. Um, and you'll be guided from darkness to light. And I, this is bad adept for me to do this while they were talking. But I just wanted to do an experiment. Also, an auntie gifted this to me, so I wanted to use it. Uh, I was able to do 300 salawat just while Sheikh Yahya and Imam Afroz were uh, talking. That's ikthar. That's a lot of salawat according to like Imam al Josi, if I, I remember correctly from Ashiyu. It's very easy to do a lot of salawat. The whole time, if I was sincere and that was accepted, Allah was remembering me and the Prophet was remembering me. Um, so these tools that he gave us, they will guide you. And, and for your daughter, if she does that sincerely, what our shiuf taught us is that will guide her to a shaykh um, that will be a means of guidance for her. Not for her. Okay, um, one question that I have with me is that, Salaamu Alaikum. Should we be concerned that most of the time, programs and initiatives that are carried by the Wahhabi are more popular especially to those who don't know any better about Wahhabi and fake Salafi compared to programs that are grounded by our tradition example Maulid, Jadakullah Khairan Can I just quickly jump in again because they can correct me uh, Firstly, we, we tend to be worried about everybody else too much but let's just, you know, this deen is introspective, and I think it was Sheikh Yahya who said it today, you know, uh, uh, this deen is to rectify our hearts with Al-Bin Salim, and that's what we're going to take to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, number two is, just look into the Qur'an, how many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to people, that those who are really loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is not in comparison to anybody, but it is about, but a few. People don't make prostration except a few, etc., etc. So numbers is of no relevance. Uh, Badr and Uhud is, is an example of all of that. Uh, our concern, our consideration, our concern is not numbers. Uh, you know, mess, m may the best da'wah win. You know, alhamdulillah. Um, just, to, just add to that, that I think there's no doubt that Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah is on the haq. They're upon the truth, there's no doubt about that. And that truth will lead to a true experience of the deen. And so there, there's no question that we want everyone to experience that. So having the concern, yes, it's important. But I think sometimes people conflate, that is, they mix up 
their concern with their actual interactions. Have that concern for everyone. You want people to experience the truth and to live the truth and to so forth and so on. But at the same time, always remember that this should be written in Ma'adhab, as I say, this should be written, uh, yeah, this is a, one of the most beautiful statements of Imam Malik. لَيْسَتْ مِنَ السُنَّةِ إِنْ تُجَادِلْ بِالسُنَّةِ وَلَكِنْ مِنَ السُنَّةِ إِنْ تُخْبِرْ بِالسُنَّةِ the reality of the prophetic way is not to argue with other people about the prophetic way. The reality of the prophetic way is to live it and to inform other people about it. That's what we live, and then we take into consideration. And if I've said about quantity uh, and, 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 and you know, numbers and so forth, but just live that reality and don't get involved in useless argumentation.